Welcome to the Grim Leftovers Show with Grimnir every Monday night at 7 p.m. Eastern on reallibertymedia.com and rlmradio.xyz. Oh, yeah, folks, it is a Monday evening once again. I am here with you, Mr. Grimnir, on your RLM radio. This is the Grim Leftovers program, episode 43. Wow, almost almost been doing this a year. Well, not quite a year, yeah. That's not until December. <laughs> anyway, well, welcome to the show, folks. Uh, glad to have you back here for another episode. It is 10-14. 10, 10, <laughs> is, is that right? Yeah, October 14, 2019, episode 43. So, yeah, I was looking at that. I was like, wait a minute. Is that, is that the right day? Yeah, it is the right day. October 14th, and we're still getting over the full moon effect, you know. The full moon was on Saturday, Sunday, yesterday. So, uh, yeah, we're still getting over the full moon effect. And uh, so that's going to be, uh, make things a little more interesting. So they say. I've been told, so I hear. <laughs> anyway, welcome to the show. Um it's it's been kind of nice out today. Uh, it got up to like seventy two degrees here, so uh, that is so much better than it was uh, earlier last week, I guess. Yeah. So uh, leftovers. Oh, uh, Beetle is making leftovers, and it is the leftovers show. How much perfect, more perfect could you get? All right. So howdy to all the folks that are listening, wherever you may be listening from, right here on RealLibertyMedia dot com or possibly on rlmradio.xyz, uh, maybe on Freedoms Network or realliberty.org, Internet Radio, Tune In, Shoutcast. Oh, heck, there's just a whole bunch of uh, places you may be. So, uh, yeah, always uh, good to have us out there. And howdy to all the folks here in the RLM chat room. I see you in here chatting away, chatting at this point in time. Mr. Sock Puppet and Rob Works and Beetle and Moose Girl. And uh, I, I saw other folks, uh, Java Doctor and and Frumpy. And, of course, the bots are always talking about something, you know. I imagine Miss Kate's out there somewhere. I haven't seen her pop up yet. Uh, it's even possible Solomon might be listening in. So howdy down there, Solomon Land. Um <laughs> You know, I got a bunch of stories lined up for you today. Now, normally I go with the stories that are like at the bottom old of the list, but oldest part of the list. But uh, today I'm going to do a few that are not quite so old because, well, I just felt that I should. And uh, and they, they seem like uh, ones that need sharing on a more timely basis, although I don't really think the time makes that much of a difference. I just decided I wanted to talk about them because, uh, well, because I wanted to. It's my show. I'll talk about what I want. <laughs> so here we go. Um, this first article comes to you from WVNews.com, which was only posted yesterday over there on that website. The headline is, Homeschooling cuts about $2 million from Harrison School System funding. And you know what I call that? A good start. Yeah. So uh, the more people that homeschool, the less money the school system gets, the government school system. Uh, so the less money the government school system gets, the better for everybody. That means they should steal less from you, not that they will, but they should steal less from you. And your kids, if you have children, um, will get a better education via you or other homeschooling people, maybe that you share homeschooling with neighbors or a group of friends or whatever. And, and, and so that's a good thing. It's a good start. So the more and more people that start pulling their kids away from the government propaganda indoctrination system, the better. Uh, so th this is this is great. So I had to share about this here. So here it is from Clarksburg. Uh, I guess that's in West Virginia. I'm not positive. It's on WV News. So anyway, the homeschool student population in Harrison County has increased by hundreds 
over the last 8 to 10 years, according to officials. Now, we're talking about hundreds here, hundreds, not thousands. And hundreds, just a mere hundreds, less than a thousand, I assume. that I, I don't know if, I, if they have that entire number. But just a mere hundreds is $2 million. $2 million for hundreds. How much is going in there for each kid? It's crazy. It's insane. Because all of those students leaving the school system to be taught at home, leaves Harrison County uh, uh, at home, leaves, who wrote this? Harrison County <laughs> has received less in state aid formula each f uh, funding each year. So on October 1st, the county submitted its enrollment total to the State Department of Education. Uh, the number of homeschooled uh, children had reached 582 according to Harrison School's attendance director. So 582, there's your number, there's my number. Yeah, 582, and that's $2 million. That's, that's, that's a lot of money per kid. Uh, over 15 years, as attendance director, Kirby said he's seen the number of homeschooled students continue to rise. When, the, when he first started working in the county, the number of homeschooled children was approximately 180 to 200 and stayed fairly steady throughout the year. As time progressed, the number of homeschoolers across the state has skyrocketed. I don't know if you really call 582 from 200 a skyrocket, but like I said, a good start. We have doubled or tripled our numbers after speaking with other attendance directors around the state, they are concerned with their county numbers increasing as well. Because, well, less money for them. They, they, they want your money, and, and they're not getting it. <laughs> Kirby said the increase in homeschooled students has a direct effect on services. Is that what they're calling it? services that the school system can provide their school system as their state formula decreases based on the number of students enrolled. Finance Director Sharon Hinkle said the number of students enrolled in the county is finalized on October 1st of each year and directly impacts the amount of state aid formula state aid formula, what, a, what an odd phrasing, that the school district will receive the following fiscal year. Our numbers as of October 1st, 2019, will affect next year's budget, she said. Every county gets really worried around this time of year when they're finalizing their enrollment because they have somewhat of a big picture idea of how much they will lose in state aid formula next year. Well, let me ask you this. If you're getting $2 million less because of a couple hundred extra students not going to your school, then don't you just need that much less? I mean, is it, it, it <laughs> wouldn't that make sense uh, on a direct mathematical situation there? If you have less students to teach, isn't it costing you less? Shouldn't you get less? All right. The school system receives a certain amount of state aid funding, depending on how many students are enrolled. Yeah, you already said that. Uh, while it does does not calculate out to per pupil basis, ah, it can be broken down that way. She said, "The newest numbers that we have received are broken down, uh, and broken down can be measured at around forty three hundred dollars and fifty cents per student, or fifty dollars per student uh, enrolled in the public school system." With over 10,000 students enrolled in the Harrison County Schools, the school system is able to employ hundreds of teachers and service personnel. The state aid formula is the main funding source that pays teachers' salaries, Hinkle said. For Harrison County Schools, the state aid formula in the school excess in, and the school excess levy both pay for personnel salaries, she said. With the loss of 582 students at the Harrison County Schools equates to a loss of $2.5 million and the potential for more than 35 school positions. Too bad, so sad. You don't need all those people. You're spending way too much on this whole schooling. Schooling. I use that word very loosely here. In this, it's not really schooling, is it? 
No, it's it's pure it's pure indoctrination. Uh, they they he, maybe they learn a few things. They learn the alphabet and how to spell some words. They learn the the fake math uh, that you guys used to teach real math. You don't teach that anymore. They they learn the fake history. Uh, hey, Beetle family, how y'all doing? Four people listening at Beetle's house. Good to have you here with us, or with me, I guess. I always say us, but it's just me. <laughs> anyway, so, yeah, that's a good start. More and more, the better the better. All right, so what are the benefits of going to a public school system? From the Free Thought Project here, uh, posted um, yesterday as well. Benefits of going to a public school system. Shocking statistics reveal police have no problem arresting hundreds of thousands of kids, 12 and younger, across the land of the free. <laughs> the school-to-prison pipeline exposed as 30,000 kids under age 10 have been arrested since 2013. Arrests of children have skyrocketed. Now, this I would call a, a true skyrocket, unlike the number of homeschooled kids. Yes, this is a true skyrocket. Uh, have skyrocketed over the last decade, according to the latest statistics published by the FBI. Gone are the days of sending children to the principal's office for a paddling. Now, children as young as six are getting arrested in police state USA. Yes, indeed. The statistics compiled from 2013 to 2018 revealed that more than 30,000 children under the age of 10 have been arrested, averaging more than 6,000 kids per year. And it says equally disturbing, I'm going to say far more disturbing, is the students at 10 to 12 years of age topped 266,000, 266,000 children, they're calling them students here, uh, I guess they are students, they're students of learning how screwed the state is, 10 to 12 years of age, been arrested, 266,000, over a quarter million, wow, in the past, students and children were disciplined with consequences such as a timeout and maybe a paddling. As more and more schools replace handling things internally with external police state options like school resource officers, children are ending up with arrest records and their fingerprints stored in databases, often referred to as school-to-prison pipeline. The principal players in the funneling of kids from school to jail are often the school resource officers, and it's got parents at their wit's end. Fortunately, eh, or maybe not, the number of students arrested each year are on the decline from 2014 until now. Eh, yeah, until they modify the numbers, which they always do. Uh, the FBI's latest crime report, released Monday, shows the number of children arrested under the age of 10 have continued to gradually decline in the past five years, from a high in 2014 of 6,458 to 3,501 in 2018. Experts say it's way too many still. What may seem like a routine policing or modern-day policing method to some, Others see as a human rights violation. I'm going to have to agree. The slippery slope leading to a criminal life and poor use of school resources. Standing in the gap, you hear that, uh, Vincent? Standing in the gap for children, some would say are advocates of restorative justice. For example, instead of calling a school resource officer when a fight breaks out on campus at a K-12 through facility, Security officers, often teachers, will bring the kids and teens into a community of concerned advocates for keeping kids out of the school-to-prison pipeline. According to the Institute for Policy Studies, 
restorative justice programs are accepted by advocacy groups and others who are highly critical of the presence of school resource officers on campus. Yeah, you just got these military jackboots running around arresting your kids, man. It's just, it's not good. So, uh, instead of calling a gun-toting, badge-wearing, steroid-fueled member of society to deal with any unruly children, the RJ team is called. When an incident arises, these parties come together for a restorative circle that includes students, staff, staff, community members, and a restorative justice practitioner. They address the harms together and try to arrive at a solution. RJ programs are catching on in schools where discipline issues have historically been a major problem. Uh, a growing number of school districts nationwide from Oakland, California to Washington, D.C. are implementing these practices. The results are promising. With referrals for school discipline down across campuses, uh, students no longer having to fear going to jail, but such a lack of fear has reportedly caused even more disruptions in the classroom. We spoke with several teachers who wish to remain anonymous, who says the RJ programs have created a Lack of consequences on campus, with students now getting away with incredibly disruptive, disrespectful behavior. Well, they're kids, you know. You're supposed to be a little disruptive and disrespectful. It's kind of the way it works. So therein lies the delicate seesaw balancing act at work. Do schools involve SROs to deal with the behavior issues, often linked to emotional issues? Or, I, I mean, just because you drug all these kids up, you know, because they, they act a certain way, that's got nothing to do with it, right? Or, do they work as a community to ensure arrests in schools never take place? According to a recent research study evaluating the outcomes of restorative justice, it is a working. The bottom line for restorative justice programs and practices is that the evidence is promising suggesting possible but still uncertain benefits for youth participants in terms of reduced future delinquent behavior and other non-delinquent outcomes. Victim participants in these programs, however, do appear to experience a number of benefits and are more satisfied with the programs than traditional approaches to juvenile justice. While additional research does need to be done to evaluate whether or not the RJ approach to dis disciplining children is the best way to go, almost everyone should be able to agree on one thing. Police have no business placing six-year-olds in handcuffs. They do not. They absolutely do not have any business doing that. So, yeah, if you have kids and they're in these schools, your first and best bet is to get them out of these schools. Because if they're in these schools and they act a little goofy one day, they could well be hauled off to jail and then given a record and have their fingerprints put into the system. Is that what you want? Is that what you want for your children? I'm pretty sure you don't. Maybe you do. I don't know. I don't know what kind of parents there are out there these days, but holy hell. All right. Enough of the school topic. Let's go on to my favorite topic. <laughs> From Electroverse.net here. This was posted on October 13th as well. Uh, and this only talks about two states, but I think New Mexico should be included. However, it doesn't. Texas and Oklahoma bust all-time cold records. Yep, all-time low temperature records continue to fall across North America. All-time low temperature records continue not to be logged by NOAA. NOAA wants no part of these all-time cold records coming at a time when they don't think they should be coming. Wichita Falls, Texas, where I was born, 
set a new record on Saturday, a new record low on Saturday, October 12th, when Mercury dipped to minus 1.1 degrees C, or 30 degrees F, cold enough to smash the previous record, low of 1.7 degrees C, or 35, set back in 1977 during, oh, a solar minimum. <laughs> which is what we're in right now. Wait a minute. You trying to tell me that the sun has an effect on the temperature here on Earth? What kind of craziness is that? All right. It was also the second earliest freeze the North Texas City ever has ever seen. So, yeah, from a tweet from NWS Norman here. If you're thinking... It's a little early for it to be this cold. You're right. Oklahoma City and Lawton had their third earliest freeze on record, while Wichita Falls had their second earliest. Many daily records were also set. Um, uh, for, furthermore, in neighboring Oklahoma City, uh, Oklahoma, set new record daily lows on both October 11th and October 12th, of uh, 32 degrees F and 28 degrees F, respectively, as did Lawton with a pair of identical temps. Hundreds of cold records have fallen across North America as of late, and they continue to fall, as does historic early season snow across the Midwest. Uh, this is the grand solar minimum. So uh, this from Electroverse over there on uh, Twitter Yes, I can confirm the blizzard is bad in Coulomb, North Dakota. No idea how much snow. Too much. But the, all, all of the corn and 99% of the soybeans are in the field. Uh, so they're probably all destroyed. So you're going to be paying more for corn and whatever they use soybeans for, which is a lot of products. Uh, they use corn for a lot of products as well. It's not just corn. Um and corn also goes in, and soybeans go into feed for livestock. So you can expect to be paying more for those because the ranchers will have to pay more for the feed. <laughs> Me personally, my garden was destroyed in one, one night, what was left of it. Um, and, and I'm fine with that. I, I was ready to be done with it anyway. But, uh, yeah, everything, boom. I could have put plastic uh, garbage bags over my tomatoes if I wanted and possibly covered some of the melons, but eh, they were growing, everything was growing so slow anyhow. However, let me just say, um, I did harvest one watermelon, which was about the size of a bowling ball, a good-sized bowling ball, maybe a little bigger. Um, and and I've been eating that over the last several days here, and it is terrific. Man, wow, what a, what a terrific fruit that is. Uh, maybe I'll have to grow some more watermelon next year. I don't know. We'll see, but that that's really good. Um, it's got a lot of seeds, so I have a lot of seeds for next year. <laughs> and that watermelon was grown from uh, uh, heirloom seed. Uh, the water, I Several watermelons started on that plant, but only one actually grew. But then again, I had bad soil, so, you know, whatever. Um, uh, anyway, the rest of the, the garden is, is just uh, overnight, boom, immediate death. <laughs> the next day, uh, as soon as the sun came up, uh, and all those frozen plants uh, defrosted, I guess. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was pretty funny. Anyway, social media channels are actively restricting our reach. Yeah, they don't want you to know about this. So uh, if you're on uh, any of the social media channels, which uh, I follow the Electroverse over there on the Twitter, uh, but you may uh, be able to share this information on your other social media sources out uh, that you that you use, uh, and go ahead. And also, don't forget to follow them uh, wherever you may be able to follow them, because uh, it's a good thing to do to keep getting the message out there that uh, yeah, there's no there's no global warming. There is no global warming. It's a hoax. It's a fake. It's a lie. <laughs> So anyway, uh, thank you for that there. Um, and, and just to, to poke another stick into the ribs of the global warming fanatics, <laughs> this posted September 9th, uh, 
on, on thegatewaypundit.com. This just keeps happening. Ship full of global warming fanatics get stuck in the Arctic ice. Yep. <laughs> In May 2009, two global warming activists were hoping to reach Greenland's polar ice cap in a solar and wind-powered yacht. Unfortunately, they ran into cold and stormy weather and had to be rescued by an oil tanker. In December 2013, a Russian expedition ship carrying global warming scientists, I use that word very loosely, got stuck in ice. And a Chinese icebreaker was sent to rescue the scientists that got stuck in the ice just miles away. <laughs> now this. The Arctic ship MS Malmo had to be rescued this week after getting stuck in the ice off of Longyear Bayan Salvbard Archipelago, whatever all that is, halfway between Norway and the North Pole. <laughs> the ship with climate change warriors, warriors, right, what are you battling, caught in ice. So the uh, Arctic Tours ship with 16 passengers on board got stuck in the ice September 3rd. Um, Arctic ship, uh, Arctic Tours ship, I miss Malmo, is what they call that, um, halfway between Norway and the North Pole. The ship is on an Arctic tour with climate change documentary film team. I wonder if they're going to include that little tidbit where they got stuck in the ice in their climate change documentary. I'm going to go ahead and guess no. And tourists concerned with climate change and melting Arctic ice. Yeah, not working so well for you. All 16 climate change warriors were evacuated by helicopter in challenging conditions. All are safe. Seven crew remains on board, waiting for the Coast Guard, Coast Guard ship assistance. So, <laughs> yeah. You're, you're out there listening to people like Al Gore and Greta, thinking somehow you're making a difference. You're making a change. You're saving the Earth. You're not. <laughs> You're just plain not. <laughs> You've been duped. You've been fooled. <laughs> and now you're getting ridiculed. All right. <laughs> All right. Over to Zero Hedge from October 13. Totally different topic, by the way. It's not a game when it's real life. China's social credit system. I've talked about the social credit system on here before uh, and referred to the, uh, the that TV show, The Black Mirror, where they had a social credit system in place and uh, what happened to the people there on that. But this is real. It's not television. It's not a game. In an attempt to imbue trust, China has announced a plan to implement a national ranking system for its citizens and companies. Currently in pilot mode, the new system will be rolled out next year and go through numerous iterations before becoming official. While this system may be a useful tool for China to manage its ever-growing 1.4 billion population, Visual capitalist Katie Jones notes that it has triggered global concerns around the ethics of big data and whether the system is a breach of fundamental human rights. And again, as I stated back uh, with, with the school to prison pipeline, yes, this is a breach of fundamental human rights. Today's infographic looks at how China proposed, proposed a social credit system could work and what the implications might be. They, they've got a graphic here showing you um, the, the, the breakdown, the feed down. You'll have to look at the graphic yourself a little later on. Uh, but but it, it's, it's, it should be scary to you. Whether it is or not, that's really up to you. 
the whole Big Brother data system, uh, scorecards, how you wind up. It, it, it's it's craziness. The government is always watching. Currently, the pilot system varies from place to place, whereas the new system is envisioned as a unified system. Although the pilot program may be more of an experiment than a precursor, it gives a good indication of what to expect. In the pilot system, each citizen is assigned a thousand points and is consistently monitored and rated on how they behave. Points are earned through good deeds and lost for bad behavior. Users increase points by donating blood or money, praising the government on social media, or helping the poor. Yes, if you praise the government on social media, you'll be given points. <laughs> Rewards for such behavior can range from getting a promotion at work uh, to receiving priority status for your children's school admissions. In contrast, not visiting one's aging parents regularly, spreading rumors on the Internet, and cheating in online games are considered antisocial behaviors. Punishments include public shaming, exclusion from booking flights or train tickets, and restricted access to public services. Big data goes right to the source. The perpetual surveillance that comes with the new system is expected to draw on huge amounts of data from a variety of traditional and digital sources. Police officers have used AI-powered smart glasses and drones to effectively monitor citizens. Footage from the, these devices showing antisocial behavior can be broadcast to the public to shame you. Oh, you bad person! <laughs> and deter others from behaving similarly. For more serious offenders, some cities in China force people to repay debts by switching to the person's ringtone or switching the person's ringtone without their permission. The ringtone begins with the sound of a police siren followed by a message such as, the person you are calling has been listed as a discredited person by the local court. Please urge this person to fulfill his or her legal obligations. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Two of the largest companies in China, Tencent and Alibaba, were enlisted by the People's Bank of China to play an important role in the credit system, raising the awareness of third-party data security. WeChat, China's largest social media platform, owned by Tencent, uh, tracked the behavior and ranked users accordingly while displaying their location in real time. Yes, wherever you are, we know. Following data concerns, these tech companies and six others were not awarded any license by the government. However, social media giants are still involved in orchestrating the public shaming of citizens who misbehave. The digital dang -an. The social credit system may not be an entirely new initiative in China. The dang -an, English meaning record, is a paper file containing an individual's school reports information on physical characteristics, employment records, and photographs. Yeah, these dossiers were first used in the Maoist years, uh, helped, the, helped the government in maintaining control, control, government control over you, you citizens. This gathering of citizens' data for China's social credit system may, in fact, be seen as a revival of the principle of Dang An in the digital era, with the system providing the powerful tool to monitor you your, and everything you do, wherever you may be, uh, whose data is more difficult to capture. It asks, 
is the system working? In 2018, people with a low score were prohibited from buying plane tickets almost 18 million times, while high-speed train ticket transactions were blocked 5.5 million times. Another 128 people were prohibited from leaving China due to unpaid taxes. This system could have major implications for foreign business practices, as preference could be given to companies already ranked in the system. Companies with higher scores will be rewarded with incentives, which include lower tax rates and better credit conditions with their behavior being judged in areas such as paid taxes, customs regulation, environmental protection. What the hell does China know about environmental protection? Anyway, despite the complexities of vast amounts of data, the system is certainly making an impact. While there are benefits to having a standardized scoring system and encouraging positive behavior... <laughs> Will it be worth the social cost of gamifying human life? Now, I can guarantee you, guarantee you, without any reservations, that the politicians in your government, here in the good old U.S. of A., want to do this exact thing. They want you to praise the government on your social media. They don't want you out there dissing it. They want you to praise the police that beat you down and kill you and throw you in a box falsely. Mostly falsely. Yes, they want you to praise them. They want you to be a solid bootlicker. Oh. <laughs> and it's coming. Oh, I guarantee you it's coming. Uh, so I, I, I don't know what they do. With people that, that don't have any of these, uh, that aren't on any of these social media systems. Or how they track them or monitor them. They say you don't have a smartphone. They can't track wherever you are all the time. Uh, they can certainly pick up your face through facial recognition anytime you're out in public somewhere. Uh, and track you that way. But that's minimal. Uh, that That's not everywhere. At this point in time, I should say. Uh, in, until, you know, they, they might say, either you have a smartphone or we're going to chip your ass. Uh, which, again, is, is a distinct possibility. A distinct possibility. <laughs> oh, man. This one I hesitated to uh, report because it comes from... Uh, the CLAP, it comes from the Corporate Labor Mass Propaganda, MSM, if you will, uh, CBS News. But still, it's here. And the information is accurate as far as I could tell. So I'm going to share it with you. October 2nd, CBS News. U.S. Agriculture Secretary says family farms might not survive. That's right. The Trump administration's message to small farmers, go big or go home, meaning sell out to the corporate entities or you're out of business, you're out of luck, you're bankrupt, unless you sell out. Sonny Perdue, President Donald Trump's agriculture secretary, said Tuesday during a stop in Wisconsin that he does not know if the family dairy farm can survive as the industry moves towards a factory farm model. In America, the get bigger, uh, the big get bigger and the small go out, Purdue said after an appearance at the World Dairy Expo in Madison. I don't think in America we, for any small business, have a guaranteed income or guaranteed profitability. Nobody asked about being guaranteed. They just asked about doing uh, business fairly in a, in a fair manner. But you, you don't you don't want that, do you? Purdue's visit comes as Wisconsin dairy farmer, farmers are wrestling with a host of problems, including declining milk prices, which are subsidized by taxes, meaning 
the money they steal from you, they use to drop the milk prices, uh, thereby driving the little guy out of business. Rising suicide rates, the transition to larger farms with hundreds or thousands of animals, and lots of disease as well, and Mr. Trump's international trade wars. Wisconsin, whose license plate call it America's Dairyland, has lost 551 dairy farms in this year alone. 638 last year, 465 in 2017. According to data from the State Department of Agriculture, Trade and Consumer Protection. <coughs> Excuse me. The legislature's uh, finance committee voted unanimously last month to spend an additional $200,000, a meager amount, to help struggling farmers deal with depression and mental health problems. But still, they're subsidizing the, dairy, the big dairy farmers. Jerry Volent, a fifth-generation Wisconsin dairy farmer with 330 cows, not a small farm at all, left the Purdue event in feeling and dis feeling discouraged about his future. What I heard today from the Secretary of Agriculture is, there's no place for me. Valence told reporters, can I get some support for my state and federal government? I feel like we're a benefit to society. Well, what you're not getting is support. You're getting the opposite of support. You are getting pushed out and intentionally. Jerry, sorry to tell you, um, not that you didn't already understand and know that, but if you're not one of those big boys, you're not getting subsidized. Getting bigger at the expense of smaller operations like his is not a good way to go, said uh, Darren Von Ruden, president of Wisconsin Farmers Union and third generation dairy farmer who runs a little 50 cow organic farm. Do we want one corporation owning all the food in the country? Hell no! Uh, Purdue said he believes that the, the 2018 farm bill should help farmers stay afloat. Uh, the bill reauthorizes agriculture and conservation programs at a rough cost of $400 billion over five years or $860 billion over ten years. See, if the government would just get out of the business altogether... These small farmers are, would do great. Of course, the big farms, you wouldn't get all that money you get from big ag, uh, which, uh, that's, why you're, that's why you're voting for these bills. <laughs> it says here that the farmers are pointing to China. Uh, General Manager Jeff Lyon for the Fir Farm First Dairy Cooperative in Madison asked Purdue for his thoughts on Trump's trade war with China. Trump administration has imposed escalating rounds of tariffs on Chinese imports to press for concessions on what it says are unfair trade practices. The administration alleges that Beijing steals and forces foreign companies to hand over trade secrets. Is there really a lot of trade secrets in dairy farming? Unfairly subsidizes Chinese companies and engages in cyber theft of intellectual property. Again, is there a lot of intellectual property in dairy farming? Maybe there is. I don't know. China's counter moves have been especially hard on American farmers because they target U.S. agriculture exports. So, yeah, you can't sell over there. Sorry, guys. Yeah. Anyway, like I said, if the, if the government would just get the hell out of the way and let the farmers farm and run their business in a laissez-faire uh, method, then then these farmers would do great. The, these little farmers, the, 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 the independent guys, but these but the but the big corporate ag man, they they would not you would not be getting the money from them that you're getting. So uh, yes, it's screw up, man. You're right, Sock. You are right. Now, I don't know what to make of this, and I really don't care one way or the other. But I thought I would share it with you because, really? <laughs> Who's running this business? <laughs> and I know, I know, you guys are doing great, you know, because, well, you sell all kinds of cheap crap at cheap prices and run run all the small guys out of business. 
But what, what's the point of this? From GunNewsUSA.com, October 9, now Walmart is dropping sales of air pistols too. Why? Eh, the retreat of Walmart from the gun business continues apace. The Arkansas retail giant conspicuously announced that they'd stop selling handgun and AR caliber ammunition in response, response to a pressure campaign by anti-gun groups following the shootings in El Paso and Dayton. It's not clear if Walmart is under the misapprehension that they can appease civilian disarmament groups with the move, or if dropping the ammunition sales was just the first step in a gradual strategy to back out of the firearm sales altogether, hoping their customers won't notice. Their customers will just go someplace else. You guys are not the only game in town, and uh, gun shops opening up up and down the, the, the road is probably a better thing anyway, because you, your gun guys don't know crap about the guns they're selling. Anyway, Whatever the company's larger strategy, they've now decided to end the sales of air pistols, too. Which is <laughs> just, just nuts. Wally World has sold a wide range of pump and CO2-powered uh, air pistols in their stores and through their website for years, but that's about to end. One of Walmart's distributors has sent the following email to their customers, a number of whom have, have passed it on, to us, on Friday, September 27, 2019, Walmart has communicated uh, to their vendors that they will no longer support the air pistol business, air pistol business, and plan to exit this category at the end of calendar year 2019. This will provide you the opportunity to pick up a piece of this business uh, as, as Walmart exits. Uh, this category. Additionally, Crossman has put together the attached program, which offers you an extra 10% discount off of normal pricing for the remainder of October on their entire lineup of air pistols. So, uh, good. Uh, people are already lining up to sell them as, as Walmart are being morons, as far as I can tell. Since they specify pistols, apparently, maybe, possibly, You'll still be able to buy the Red Ryder BB gun there, the the, the rifle type uh, air pistols, air air guns at Walmart. I, I don't know for now. So they uh, Gun News USA has requested a comment from Walmart's corporate headquarters on the change, but has not yet received a response. Unlikely <laughs> that you will, but if they do, they'll post a update on their website here uh, about that. So. Uh, what the hell, Walmart? What, what's wrong with you guys? What is wrong with you guys? <laughs> I don't get it. I don't get it. Wait one second. I got I got Sorry, I had to cough. And now I need a sip of water. All right. All righty then. This next thing I have for you, it's not an article. It's a patent. It is a patent for a certain product. <laughs> oh. For those of you that don't believe, for those of you that think I walk around all day wearing a tinfoil hat, which it's a metaphorical one, but I do. Yes, I absolutely do wear my metaphorical tinfoil hat at all times, to block out the mind-reading rays and the aliens beaming thoughts into my head. <laughs> yes, indeed, I wear a tinfoil hat. But that doesn't make me wrong all the time, some of the time, most of the time. Anyway, here's this for you. Nervous system manipulation by electromagnetic fields from monitors. 
your computer monitor, your televisions, other types of things like that. I, I feel like I've talked about this before, but maybe my, my tinfoil hat slipped and I forgot. I'm not sure. I know I've talked about it a lot, maybe in other ways, even if not directly on here. But I wanted to at least get it on the record, absolutely, for sure, in case I hadn't talked about it and just maybe thought that I had. Maybe I had my own little Mandela moment within my brain saying, no, 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 you've already talked about this. Don't share this with people. <laughs> the abstract. Physiological effects have been observed in a human subject in response to stimulation of the skin with weak electromagnetic fields, weak ones, that are pulsed with certain frequencies near the half hertz or 2.4 hertz, uh, such as to excite a sensory resonance. Many computer monitors and TV tubes, uh, this, this is a, a patent from 2001, so there was a lot more of the uh, cathode ray tubes going on back then, and a lot less uh, of, of the LED and LCD monitors. However, it still applies regardless um, of, of the type of monitor that you're having. Uh, such as to excite sensory residents. Many computer monitors and TV tubes, when being pulsed, images emit pulsed electromagnetic fields of sufficient amplitudes to cause such a excitation. It is therefore possible to manipulate the nervous system of a subject, you, by pulsing images displayed on a nearby computer monitor or TV set. You don't even have to be watching it. For the latter, the image pulsing may be embedded in the program material, or it may be overlaid by modulating the video stream, either as an RF signal or as a video signal. The image displayed on the computer monitor may be pulsed effectively by a simple computer program little algorithm stuck in there. For certain monitors, pulsed electromagnetic fields capable of exciting sensory resonances in nearby subjects may be generated even as the displayed images are pulsed with subliminal intensity. The background of the invention. The invention relates to the stimulation of the human nervous system by an electromagnetic field applied externally to the body. The neurological effect of the external electric fields has been mentioned by Wiener, not Anthony, in 1958 in a discussion of the bunching of brain waves through nonlinear interactions. The electric field was arranged to provide a direct electrical driving of the brain. Wiener describes the field as set up by a 10 hertz alternating voltage of 400 volts applied in a room between ceiling and ground. Brennan describes in 1992 in a U.S. US patent, number 5169380, an alternating electric field is applied across the head of the subject by two electrodes placed a short distance from the skin. And that's a little different. That's, that, that, that's, that's more invasive uh, than, than what you're getting off of your monitor. Anyway, I, I'm going to let you go through this, this patent and read it, but let me give you the important part that I highlighted here in the summary of this article. Computer monitors and TV monitors can be made to emit weak, low-frequency electromagnetic magnetic fields merely by pulsing the intensity of displayed images. Experiments have shown that the one-half hertz sensory resonance can be excited in this manner in a subject near the monitor. The 2.4 hertz sensory resonance can also be excited in this fashion. Hence, a TV monitor or computer monitor can be used to manipulate the nervous system of nearby people. The implementations of the invention are adapted to the source of the video stream that drives the monitor. Uh, be it a computer program or a TV broadcast, a videotape or a DVD. There's a lot more in this article, like I said, or in this patent posting, as I said. So uh, 
And, and there's a lot of things, uh, various things, uh, including chemtrails, that you could look up by patent uh, on the interwebs. Yes, chemtrails are patented by the U.S. government. Imagine that. <laughs> a lot of the bad stuff, a lot of the bad stuff that happens to you uh, is patented by, by your government. Oh, yeah, just look at some of those vaccine patents that they have out there. Oh, nasty, nasty, nasty stuff. All right. <laughs> I've warned you people about this. I've warned you. Time and time again, I've warned you. But, not that you could have done anything about it, because they're going to do what they're going to do, regardless of what information you may have. You may go out and wave a sign around. They're still going to do it. This article from the New York Post, posted September 17th here, Plan to kill off mosquitoes backfires. Spawning mutant hybrid insects. Yeah, yeah. Sounds like a horror movie, doesn't it? <laughs> Life has found a way. No, this is not Jurassic Park. <laughs> In what sounds like the plot to a sci-fi channel original movie, a plan to curb a mosquito population has backfired spectacularly making the disease carriers even more resilient to pest control measures. Ah, uh, yes. The plan involved genetically altering mosquitoes in Brazil so their babies would die instantly. However, the company that hatched the plan, British biotech firm Oxitec Limited, then released the mutant mosquitoes with the hope that they'd breed with the wild insects and spread the entomological SIDS gene, causing the population to plummet substantially. This, they pronounced optimistically, would drastically reduce mosquito-borne disease such as Zika and dengue fever. For a time, the plan seemed to be going swimmingly. The genetically modified mosquitoes bred with their wild counterparts causing a dip in the wild population. Have you ever seen the movie Mimic? It's the same story, except with cockroaches in New York. This woman, scientist woman, <laughs> but, <laughs> developed this, uh, what do they call it, the Judas bug, Judas cockroach, to, to go out and mate with the the... the the regular cockroaches, and it had a Terminator gene in it, basically. So all the cockroaches would die off. Um, <laughs> and, it, and it worked swimmingly, as the article here says, at first, and all the cockroaches they saw died off. And there was a big party, a big parade. Hooray! We got rid of the cockroaches. Lovely. But then it didn't work. Then it didn't work! <laughs> and the cockroaches, well, I ain't going to tell you. Watch the movie Mimic. It's a really good one. I, I enjoyed it tremendously. <laughs> I've seen it a number of times. Yes, the numbers came roaring back in this mosquito population a mere 18 months later. Researchers think that the wild female mosquitoes, hey, baby, you look a little wild, uh, may have grown wise to the measure and began avoiding the genetically modified males. Uh, no GMO males for me, she says. And if that wasn't Jurassic Park enough, the wild mosquitoes could have developed a resiliency to the measure, making their population even harder to quash. Now the region has been left with a huge population of hybrids. Combinations of Brazilian native mosquitoes and Cuban and Mexican breeds that were genetically altered in the lab. An outcome that could make the entire population more resistant to the original mosquito control measures. Uh, the claim was that genes from the, rele the release strain would not get into the general population because the offspring would die. Again, directly from that movie Mimic. 
Yale researcher Jeffrey Powell, one of the authors of the study, told the New Atlas that obviously was not what happened. Uh, you think? <laughs> it's all especially scary, considering the uptick in mosquito-borne illness brought about by global warming. <laughs> Last week, a Nebraska confirmed mosquito, a mosquito notorious for spreading illnesses such as Zika and a yellow fever. And last month, the deadly triple E virus infected a Michigan girl, putting her in a critical condition. Now, I know I'm over my time already, uh, out of time, over my time. But I got one more little thing to share with you. And it's just for the comedy factor, the humor, the fun. Not that any of you want to buy any of these products, but the headline says you will. And I'm just going to run through them uh, real fast here. <laughs> this posted on 2panda.com, T-O-O-O, panda.com. Um, and it says, 12 products that are so bad, you will buy them. And at the top... <laughs> Is something called fanny floss. Fanny floss. <laughs> Which apparently is like a string. You run up and down your ass crack. <laughs> ah! <laughs> All right, no one, no one, no one out of that. Um, this next thing, I, 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 I'm not really sure if anybody, and it looks like it's a really old product. Uh, something from maybe the 50s or 60s. I don't know. And it's called a daddy saddle. And what it is is a saddle that you would strap on daddy so the kid could ride you like a horsey. <laughs> All right. Then they have um, defecation tea. Do you really need to, to uh, explain that? But apparently, you better be sitting on the toilet when you drink it. <laughs> this one, uh, I, I don't think the, the, uh, the, the label actually matches the ingredients. Child shredded meat. It's a Chinese, Chinese translation. <laughs> I don't know what's in it. Then they have something called um, virginity soap. Um, okay, virginity soap. And of course, there's the, the broiled baby that you could buy at your local uh, Korean store. Broil, broiled baby, only $4.49 each. <laughs> they, have a, they have a Barbie and Ken here showing Ken standing behind the horse doing something to the horse. I don't know. Um, of course, now we have... Uh, a homemade jam, black raspberry, the family fruit basket LLC, and it says tastes like grandma. <laughs> there, there is a, a, a type of soda, uh, Coca Cola, not, not Coca, Coca, type of cola, per, bottled in Ghana, and it's called P Cola, P E E Cola. Now they have, and I don't know what they were thinking here. Um, <laughs> there's a deal used to pick your turkey up out of, out of the platter after you cook it. Um, it's a, it's like a hook thing, and they call it the turkey hooker. And on the on the label, they got a picture of a turkey uh, trying to do a, a sexy pose in high heels. And <laughs> I don't know. I'm not even sure what this is. It just says crap, and it's some kind of food product. Uh, apparently, it's a Romanian dialect. Um, then they have, uh, I guess that's a shampoo? Yeah. Suddenly straight. So if you know any gay people, and you want to, and, and, and they're looking to, 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 to not be gay anymore, so you just buy them a bottle of this shampoo here. Suddenly straight. <laughs> All right. All right. That'll, that'll do it. <laughs> I'll wrap it up. 
Thank you all for tuning in so much here to the uh, Grim Leftovers program. I'll be back again next week with episode 44 on the 21st of October. Hope, hopefully you all are back with me as well. Um, tomorrow we'll, we'll be Flash somebody and hopefully Grammy Mary along with him uh, on In a Perfect World at 1 p.m. Eastern on uh just check the schedule on com for all the shows that are on RLM Radio or Real Liberty Media. Appreciate you all being here. Thank you all so much for being part of Real Liberty Media. And we'll talk to you all later. Have yourselves a good night. Peace.